Hello, my name is Jeff Ginger. I am core personnel on the What If Hypothetical Implementations in Minecraft grant. This is NSF funded research with principal investigator Chad Lane at the University of Illinois. And as part of what we do, we run a Minecraft server for research. So we run activities with kids that come play on the server and then we're able to look at the data about how they engage with multiple learning experiences and learning objectives. And what this workshop is on today is to explain how you can set up a server similar to ours in your classroom or your school environment. Or, or actually in your library. It doesn't necessarily, a lot of what we do is actually informal learning where there are uh, oftentimes uh, there's longer periods of time we can work with kids and we might have more help from technical folks. It, oftentimes schools have more constraints. So really don't feel like this has to happen in a school. Although if your school is set up for it, that's great too. So before I get into all this, I wanted to go over a short history of Minecraft. Uh, not everybody's familiar that the game is over a decade old. It's had lots and lots of people playing in it, which is kind of crazy when you think about it, that people started playing this game as kids and then they grew up. And a lot of those experiences they had playing this game as kids probably filtered into what they turned into as adults, especially because so many kids have been playing it. And it only looks like it's going to continue is that we're really going to have a generation spanning game. And there aren't that many games that are out there that are like that, which is really cool. It started out as this is my understanding of the history, which you know I'm sure is very incomplete, but this is just the overview of it for the sake of this video. It started out in 2009, where it was just an alpha. It was sort of this uh, fun project done by the, these crazy guys in Nord Northern Europe, and it, they didn't really think of it as this giant enterprise that was gonna make tons of money or influence education. It was more like a cool pet project for uh, making a game that they liked. Uh, but it started growing in by 2011 they got out of the alpha and they became an official version and they iterated through features in a several uh, patches and updates and it was around this time that we started seeing some of the first serious modding and custom servers coming out is that uh, lots of uh, it wasn't just uh, older adults getting into the game it was a lot of kids too at this time and they started coming out with versions like the pocket edition for mobile which at the time was exceptionally limited but you know there was the, the beginnings of that as well um, and they went through all sorts of updates anything from like adding horses to some of the blocks that we you know redstone kinds of stuff that we think of now all of that kind of came out in the early community growth phases. By the time we hit 2015, the game had really become largely mainstream. And they started introducing major alterations to the block model. And for servers, running servers, this became a major uh, problem, essentially, is that uh, they would update the game and then everybody would have to deobfuscate the code and it would take the community a long time to like dig into this and figure out how it worked. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, they would update the game. We'd have to wait quite a while for that to happen. But because the updates were few and far between, it was possible. Um, many of the really cool server projects that I've seen, anything from like custom monsters to like weird atmosphere, atmospheric mods, all that kind of stuff kind of ended in the 2011 through 2014 era or the 2015 through 2017 era is that oftentimes people would just put a lot of work into creating some sort of custom mod or custom server uh, just for that version and they kind of just left it there. They couldn't stay with the project forever. And then towards the end of this, they, Microsoft came into the picture as they merged all of this into the Bedrock Edition. Basically everything like on Xbox, on iPads, on cell phones, everything except for the Java version on Windows, oh, Windows or, or Mac, I guess, Windows or OS X, got merged into what they call Bedrock. And that was good. They unified all their platforms, but it also meant that there was sort of this, these two competing strains of Minecraft. And that leads us to our current picture of since 2018, we've been having this, there's the community developed Java version, which is still very much like at its roots, you know, open that people can play around with. And, you know, it has all the baggage of Java of it's not very efficient. <laughs> um, and there's the sort of a bulkiness to it, but that you can do so much with it, which is great. And then they have the Bedrock strain that has like versions like the C++ version on Microsoft Windows, but also versions on iPad or Android. And uh, those, those are a lot more closed source. And the reason that I think Microsoft is doing this is largely this, is that the numbers as best I can tell, because they don't release that much information about this, is that you have roughly 112 million players. So lots and lots of people playing Minecraft. But the vast majority of them are playing on cell phones and iPads and, and the sort of the closed bedrock environments. 
game consoles, that kinds of stuff. And there's there's not a lot of modding, not a lot of cool plugins. The, what you can do on that is really, really limited. And it also tends to be younger, less educated users. Where And I don't mean like they're dumb. I just mean that they haven't learned about all the other possibilities of the game. As you know, a parent's like, oh, kids are into Minecraft. I'll buy them Minecraft on the iPad. And they don't really know that they can't do that much on the iPad. And that, for instance, on the iPad, you're not learning how to uh, like point and move with the mouse and WASD, which are the same controls, by the way, that you would use to influence yourself in a 3D modeling environment, which I would call a computer literacy skill. Uh, it's more like just you know tapping on the screen and it's, it's a little bit more casual, but there are tons of players there. So there's this massive opportunity there. And then there's about 30% that's still on Java. And the average age as quoted in the, the source, the one of the few sources I could find on this, of average age of a Minecraft player is 24. Uh, which is kind of surprising because that's pretty old but what it really is just showing is the really wide range of age of players you have a lot of like parents playing with their kids you have people that grew up learning how to play that now might still dink around in college that kind of stuff and roughly 30 percent of these players are playing on java by the estimate that the estimate that i was able to find and Java is the really exciting version of Minecraft that we're interested in. It's, it's very much engaged in the community and open source tools, and it has the history of this game being a story that you make, that, that you really determine what it means and how it works. And I think when you get into the, the more uh, sort of narrow platform oriented ones that are more about like, can we sell as many units as possible for as many cell phones as possible, it starts kind of drifting away from that. I'm gonna turn the game into whatever I need it to be kind of mindset. So uh, today, what I'm talking about is servers that are designed for Java. But I did want to explain that you have, <laughs> here, here's once again to reiterate this, different kinds of versions of Minecraft and different servers that you can use for this. So Java Edition has lots of sort of families. The two major families that I know of is Forge, which is a very mod-oriented server set. So you can download Forge locally to your computer and then play with really cool, interesting modified versions of the game, which might like add new kinds of creatures like dinosaurs, or it, it might allow you to spawn a tornado. There's some really, really powerful, cool stuff people have done with Forge. And then there are also Forge servers, where if in order to join that server, you have to have the mods that that server is using. So you have to set up your computer to match that. And again, this is the kind of thing that's really easy to do on a good powerful PC, not so easy to do on a cell phone. You can't run this version in the, on those kinds of devices. The other major family, which is the one that we work with, is uh, I guess Bucket, Spigot, or Paper Minecraft. They're all kind of the same family of the same type of server. And this one, the idea is more that you can just download the standard version of Java Edition Minecraft. You don't have to add any mods and you'll be able to join one of these servers. The servers provide things like resource packs and plugins that change your experience there. And so this is the more ideal one, I think, for an education setting, because then you don't have to have people who are, you don't have to have control all the different users' computers and set them up specifically. You just have to have them have a Java edition version of Minecraft, and then you can set up all the plugins and things, backend, your, your database, all that kinds of stuff on the server on your own. Um, and then down here we have the Bedrock edition, which like I said, is on things like game consoles and iPads. Um, and there are servers for this. Uh, some that I mentioned here is in the Nookit. Uh, they have a, a strain that is used for, uh, it's probably, I think it's the most popular one. And there's a Wikipedia page that, that or a, a Minecraft wiki, I should say, page that points at many of the others. I haven't used any others other than Nookit, which, you know, you can make a creative mode server for Bedrock and it's fine. There's not that much you can do with it. They have a little bit of mod support where they're trying to port over different mods, like the ability to protect your structures and that kind of thing. Um, and then they, there are packet interpreters. So Geyser is one of them. There are some others that are a little bit more custom than that uh, of this idea where you're going to have the, the differences between them is the block data uh, might be a little bit different, but then also the way that they're exchanging, the server is exchanging data with the client is a different protocol. So to go to mobile back to a, a, a Java server, you need some sort of interpreter like Geyser. So to connect to a Java server with a cell phone, it is possible you can use one of these interpreters. What I found is that generally if you have any plugins involved at all, it's not going to work. So I have been able to get people to, to connect to them, but there's all sorts of problems with lag and plugins that break and people that disconnect, get disconnected for being perceived as flying or cheating or other stuff like that. So they're, they're trying to make it work, but it's kind of rudimentary stages. It's good if you had like a Java server where you, you, you were building and that it was just kind of a vanilla creative mode and you wanted to connect with a cell phone, you could probably use one of these to make that happen. So this is the lay of the land of the versions of Minecraft and the server types that are out there.
Okay, uh, so first and foremost, I really don't mean to dog on Bedrock Edition that much. I actually think it's really, really good for what I would identify as the K through five zone, the youngest, the earliest learner players. And Minecraft Education Edition has a really great page. You can go check it out. Uh, it's, it's available for most schools and institutions. You just need to have the right kind of email and they have a good sign up process. And it will work on things like iPads and um, on, on uh, simple devices. They're not yet available on Chromebooks, which is probably their biggest challenge right now because every school in America buys a million Chromebooks because they don't cost anything. And that's, you know, you're kind of stuck with a cell phone with a keyboard. Um, and so eventually that'll be possible there too. But it's great for K through five because many of the activities are, they have these sort of scripted, uh, like things like you can go detect types of blocks and learn a little bit about uh, how that might feed an artificial intelligence and uh, learn basic coding with instructions. They have some great introductory lessons set up and it's, they, they do a great job of explaining to teachers how to get set up and what they might, like a, a sort of simple frameworks for lesson plans and all that kind of thing. So if you're dealing with very beginner level, entry level users, that's great. This is where I would probably tell you to start. Uh, in, in some places you can get, or in some conditions, you can get an Office, Office 360 account where you can also get a Minecraft Education Edition license, which is cool, which means you might be able to get classroom sets of these for free versus the $27 or whatever it costs for Java version. So uh, I think it's worth checking out. We are actually working with the people at Microsoft to see if we can take some of the activities we do on Java over to Bedrock, which would be super cool. I'm hoping that, that maybe that we'll get the ear of their developer team to actually implement some stuff or open it up a little bit more. Uh, and that between that and getting it launched for Android, I think those are maybe their two bigger challenges. Anyway, so why, why do I insist so much on Java? I'm sure you've been picking it up as a, I've kind of been a little snide in my, <laughs> my presentation of, of uh, education edition. So obviously there's a lot more you can do with the Java edition. It's much more robust. The fact that you can do mods at all or server plugins at all. You can do things like high definition textures, which for us was a really big deal. We, we even had a camp where we had student participants that, you know, the, the default little character in Minecraft is kind of like a little angry white dude. And we have participants that are very different than that. They don't want to be the default of a little angry white dude with an ax. Like they'd rather be like an astronaut or there was somebody who wanted to be a musician with a rainbow suit. Or uh, we had one young participant who wanted to have a hijab as part of their, their display of their character. And you can make little custom basic pixel skins, but we actually use Photoshop and we use layers for a custom HD texture pack. This is the kind of thing that you can only really do in Java. So there's stuff like that, that you can create much more complex simulations and interactions actions and you can curate the user experience so much more with Java platform just because there's the entirety of the entire community of people that have de developed for it. it, it you know, Microsoft has a lot of talented developers, but there's like thousands of people across the world that are developing for the community edition and that is so, so powerful. Uh, you can also do data. And this is the biggest thing for me as a researcher and an educator is that I can have a server, I can have people act doing things on the server and I can collect data about what they're doing and, and how they've done it. And that is really helpful for understanding their learning process or noting where there are challenges and that kind of thing. And we currently can't do anything like that with Bedrock. And so from an educator researcher perspective, I just don't think it's quite as where I want it to be. Oh, and I, I kind of skipped this on the robust note. There's a whole lot of tools that allow for shape user experience, but also controlling it. So one of the things we've been able to do with our creative mode server is we're able to do things like block lava buckets so that users can't run all over the place and pour lava to spam on each other's creations and ruin them, right? And I don't have that level of control in Bedrock. Uh, that I found is that there's that we can do all kinds of things with region and undoing damage that's been done that are just not available in the bedrock version that, that are also helpful for educators, not just from the data collection perspective, but from also the shaping how their participants work to get more out of it. Um, and anyway, so the data, we can actually literally create databases, which then can be farmed and that's scalable. You know, we've only been doing this with smaller groups of like 30 kids tops, but you could take this and have a server like Mindplex and have the database on it and be looking at how many people are collaborating, how much based on which blocks they're placing, when, where, and how. That's awesome. That kind of data I think is cool for an information scientist like me. And then I kind of already answered this one of Java edition just has this massive community is that, it, you know, that Microsoft, I think a lot of the people who work there are great. I've, I've met many of them. They, they have great intentions. They really want to do cool things. Microsoft is one of the few companies that does research, right? That they want to have, you know, if they're thinking about down the road and bigger picture, and that is awesome. 
Uh, that said, they do have to sell things to make money. And so they have a big investment in selling for mobile platforms, even though the mobile platform like cell phones and iPads and all that stuff are so much worse for computing, more people have them and they will get lots of kids to buy or lots of parents to buy on those. So that 70% I was shown earlier, that translates to money. So they're emphasizing the bedrock edition because they need, have a bottom line to meet. And I don't think that that's the agenda of everybody there. I think actually the people in the education edition have a pretty different agenda, but they're still oriented by what is put down on them from high. And this is me saying this, none of them have ever told me this, this is my evaluation of the situation, is that they're being told, yeah, we gotta make money because we're a company. So you all gotta, we wanna promote Bedrock Edition. We're gonna do that. And they're not thinking about like, <clears throat> you know, we're gonna make everything open source and work with the open source community and, and do that stuff because that won't be as profitable to them. So the Java edition has something that I, as an academic who's interested in building on the knowledge and work of others to create greater social goods and greater knowledge for everybody, I really like the community version of Java edition because of that, is that we can really lean into each other. Okay, I'm gonna take a break after the slide here. Okay, so one of the first questions is, what does this server look like? In our case, it's an old box like that. You can see it in the lower left of this slide. Uh, that is an old computer case that we found at our university surplus, and a lot of the parts in it are a little old too. So I don't think these things have to be super powerful. Uh, we do have the benefit of the university's broadband, though, is that we can plug into their internet, which is incredibly powerful and fast, which is definitely a prerequisite for running a server that's going to be used by people in a significant way. But uh, from hardware, it is helpful to have a multi-core processor. Even though Java may not always be able to use it, you can have your operating system and other tasks running on one core or multiple other cores as you have Java running on another. Uh, cache size, as we've noticed, because we, we have actually have a Xeon processor in ours, and we ran it before on like an i5, and it, it didn't seem to affect performance in a significant way. Um, but we did notice a difference on, on uh, going from a dual core to a quad core over the years. So that one I would recommend. Uh, RAM, we actually run on a RAM cache, which is crazy. So we have random access memory. We have uh, 16 gigabytes is what I would say uh, would be like, like you want to reserve some of that for the, the game server, like what you're actually running the game on or the server on, and then some for the operating system. And if you're running other programs on there, you might want to have more, but lots of RAM is pretty helpful. RAM is fairly cheap. Now, it doesn't, again, have to be the newest. So you could have an older computer that has like a quad core processor and has DDR3 RAM that you got for cheap or found somewhere, and that's fine. Uh, and so when I say we have a RAM cache, what that actually means is we've created a temporary hard drive storage space on our RAM using another third-party program. And so it actually runs Java and the server everything on RAM, which we found impacted chunk loading times. So when somebody would encounter a new part of the level, it would load it very quickly from there. Uh, and then we do have a solid state drive and it'll write on and off of that RAM cache. If you're just running the server straight up, I think having an SSD is just generally with computing period, Solid state drives are the fastest way or the, the most, the thing you're most likely to notice in terms of speed impacts. And if the, the biggest thing you can do to upgrade an old computer is to do a solid state drive. So servers don't necessarily have to get that big either. So having a small, small solid state drive is no big deal. Uh, you can run on Linux or Lin Linux or Windows, <laughs> Linux or Windows as for your server. I, I think stability is pretty key for either one of those. It's probably possible to do on OS X. I haven't actually looked into that. Uh, OS X hardware is usually pretty good. So I don't know, I, I, I would invite you to check that one out. We've always done either Linux or Windows. And then, like I said, we use a RAM disk, RAM cache. Uh, and then internet. So you need to have a very, very powerful internet line to if you're gonna be hosting a lot of players. Uh, for us, we also ran into this issue with wireless. It was one of the first times we had this problem in the lab where we wanted to have like 30 laptops connecting to the same wireless router. And uh, the university has their network, but it wasn't able to handle that in the one room we were in at the time. So we actually set up our own parallel wireless network. So, uh, you know, those, there's things like that that might affect your, your environment. But uh, we also have a permanent IP, so internet protocol address. Our server has a permanent address that's been assigned to it. And uh, we then use something called dynamic DNS. So this no-ip.org is a place you can get a dynamic address for free. Uh, and you might be able to get through your institution a long-term address. We also did have to get outside of the firewall for our university setting. Uh, if you're setting this up at home, you probably have control over your own router. Um, and the, the, the PowerPoint version of this should have links to these things, the tutorial uh, supporting tutorial has links to places where you can like get to settings on how to make it work with your router. 
Uh, we also backed up our worlds because we're running on a RAM cache, which means if like the power goes out, we might lose all the data. So we make sure we back things up all the time. Uh, but we also use Google Drive to exchange uh, files back and forth. So at different times during our camps, participants might save a schematic, save a copy or a blueprint of something they made, and we want to export that off to move it to another computer and vice versa. They might work on a client machine to create something and we want to upload it to the server. So we use things like Google Drive and this, this little program called Backup, or but with a V instead of an A, uh, that just copies parts, portions from one directory to another. And so these are all things that affected our hardware setup. Uh, this is if you want to make your own in-house server. Like you basically can get an old computer, plug it in the wall, get your IT people to get you through the internet to the internet, and you can run that for your classroom or your library. Uh, you can also pay for one. Uh, so we've been using Beast Node for the grant. Uh, the, the test server, which is like, like our first, the one we run at the Fab Lab, it became our test server. Uh, it's been nice because we can mess around with it and we have control over it all the time, but it does take some upkeep. And paying for a server is not significantly experience, expensive. Rather. Um, places like uh, Beast Node, don't, uh, they, they have pretty much all the functionality you could get on your own custom server, which is neat. Uh, one thing to consider, though, is if you were going to collect data that had personally identifiable information in it and you were concerned about, uh, you know, research ethics and whether or not that information could get out, I don't generally think data in Minecraft is all that uh, threatening or concerning, but it's possible. You know, maybe you could have a simulation on, like, emotional experiences or something and kids put their names on signs. And so, anyway, if you wanted to keep track of that data, you might want to have your own local server to make sure you got control of it versus somebody else. Okay, so uh, the workshop that I ran through in the Philippines, we installed Paper Minecraft. Uh, and uh, it was, we set it up to be local on your machine. Uh, this was just because in that setting, we couldn't actually, we, we didn't know how, if we could get through the firewall and, and <laughs> everything else. And it's basically the same thing as if you were gonna be setting up at home. We knew that essentially setting up a server is gonna depend on your internet setup wherever you're doing it. Uh, okay. And I think actually, I'm gonna stop at this slide for the narration and leave the rest of this as just for reference. But I, at the time of the workshop, I did show around our Fab Lab server a little bit. I remoted, remote desktop in, which is the way that we help manage it. So I, didn't, I could actually be across the entire world uh, messing with that server, which is kind of cool. So that's something to think about if you were gonna run yours, is how and where you're gonna manage it. Um, and then I, I showed we actually use build tools, which means we compile our version of the server. Uh, Paper Minecraft is much easier than that. You just kind of like download a version of it, launch it, and, and that's about it. Uh, but we also had the opportunity to go through, maybe I have a slide for it, right? Yeah, we, we generated worlds. So there's a great tool called World Painter. So if you're going to get started with this on your own, go check out World Painter. It's, it's free and open source and wonderful. And you, it's sort of this global scale world design tool. And there's some good tutorials on the internet, on YouTube, uh, but you can like do things like paint surfaces with trees. Or if you wanted to create an alien world or an exoplanet, like what we were doing for our grant, is you can create like a schematic of a crater. And then you could stamp those craters all over the surface and create what might look like the pocketed surface of a moon. So it's an incredibly powerful, this is a great example of why Java Minecraft is just so much more powerful, is that tools like this are great. And that, that same method of like creating terrain, you can also do some really cool things. In our 3D printing camp, we have individual participants create little houses or bridges or, or parts of uh, like, like lamps or gardens or something. And then we actually generate a city algorithmically. We define an area that then paints that area with all those schematic files, creating the city of, cool, of all the cool stuff they made. Uh, so really, really cool tool. You can create your, uh, your world map with that to actually then use. Um, oh, and then, yeah, so depending on what you want out of your server, this is worth mentioning, uh, it, within Minecraft, besides there being Bedrock and Java, there's also different versions of the game mode. So survival is what a lot of kids play on. It's the default where, like, you're trying to, to get food and avoid zombies killing you at night and, like, collect you know, resources to sort of survive. And um, it's the base game. And I, I think it can be really great for collaborative learning with other people. It is also the form of the game where, because there's this competition uh, there are more likely to be behavior problems of like kids stealing each other's stuff or only paying attention to like killing a zombie instead of like learning something. So we don't really use survival mode in our classroom or learning environments. We tried it a few times to get kids to collaborate more and we really found that it, it was really hard to do. Small groups of kids, we could, but any more than that just wasn't a very scalable thing. Not the kind of thing you can run in a classroom and not have anything but chaos. 
Uh, creative mode has really been our go-to for most of our camps and, and most of what we've been doing. And uh, just because you change the nature of the game, when the game is about building cool stuff, it's people care about it in a different way and you get different kinds of participants. So in survival mode, you might have like, you know, kids like getting into sword fights with each other. And that might be say a big turnoff to users who don't like violence interactions very much. Creative mode just doesn't have violent interactions like that. Although you can do things like build a, a TNT launching cannon or a, you know, a spaceship that would fly above and drop bombs. So it is possible to be violent in it, but it, you have to at least work hard to build and think about the complexities of something to get there. So I, it's at least more of an educational experience. So anyway, they, they both have implications for classroom control. The third is adventure mode, which is where a server has already been set up and you're going through an experience on the server and it's kind of like an adventure. And so you might be able to trigger certain things like you can see the character here running away, like they get into a trap and oh no, they have to run out. So it's kind of telling a story as they go. And designing adventure mode levels is one of the best things I think you can do on Minecraft is you have to figure out how to do redstone or command blocks to design this experience for the user. And you're essentially doing game design. You're having to think about what, you know, what, what's the sale point on this? How do I explain for them how it's gonna work? Uh, you're thinking about all the interaction design beneath it. So creative mode and adventure mode are really what we've gotten into in Minecraft. And this is why I say it's at the more advanced level. These are both pretty darn hard to do uh, with a lot of success at K through five, which is where education edition can reign supreme and be a good starter platform. And then really when you start getting to junior high and up into, if you do play in high school, these are the best game modes to do with that audience, I think. Okay, uh, so as part of this, you would be setting up a database, presumably, because you might want to get some information about what your students are doing. And there's actually quite a bit you can log. So you can look at, for instance, with the things they say to each other, how they talk to one another. Now, if they're in person in a classroom environment, you could also just put a recorder on the table and get the data that way. So, you know, no big deal there, no, nothing new there. Uh, but if they're playing remotely, there's some opportunity with, with tracking their text. And there might be, a, you know, you can, like all the digital humanities, you can take a giant manifest of text and analyze it for use of language and uh, anything from their demeanor like whether or not they're upset or happy with each other to uh, are they using technical words or is there lingo that kind of stuff you can also get information about how they place blocks and destroy blocks and so it's possible to actually automate detection of griefing Griefing is when somebody else, it's like basically just bullying in a video game world. Like when one kid destroys another kid's stuff and then laughs at him and likes being cruel to them. But you can actually detect this. So we have plugins to detect it and undo it. Um, but you can also in the database have a record of it, which is kind of cool. That You can notice that, all right, uh, we, we've seen um, this user logged in and built a bunch of stuff. And then the next day, this user logged in and destroyed that same stuff. We know they're different users. We can probably surmise that that was a griefing episode. Uh, likewise, we can look at, oh, there's these blocks that are happening in this area and they're being placed and being destroyed in very short periods of time. And by two players at the same time in the same proximity, we can probably guess that they're building together. And we can get a sense of how in, like intensely they're building together, how much, you know, if one's just modifying a little bit versus they're really intensely doing a collaborative thing. So there's cool stuff like that that I think really gives a, you can get that out of the data. Uh, all these plugins that we use on our server are able to write to a database. So you, the Core Protect, which is the one that we've used for a lot of this, the kind of data mining that I just mentioned, uh, is, is probably the, the most essential element of it. But you can also use the database in a proactive way where like we have students make observations with signs. So th there's a, a exoplanet, they're looking at it and they have to observe, you know, like what's the temperature? We have a plugin for them to check the temperature and they'll put down a sign that says the temperature there. And that actually goes into our database. That observation is then logged and we can look at it later to see, all right, what did they observe? How did they observe it? And for us, this is also important where, you know, we're trying to think that, help them think about what it is to be a scientist. And, uh, you know, how to make good observations. Are we counting things? Are we comparing things? You know, what are the words we're going to use to define stuff? Were things like operationalization, scary words like that. So we can, we can farm a lot of that. There's sort of three ways that databases can happen. Uh, none, you can just not, you can do it the old fashioned way. Have somebody with a clipboard watching what kids are doing. You can do screen capture. There's other ways to get data on how the kids are participating. That's fine. I would actually use that in addition to databases a lot of the time as the way to validate whether or not your data is any good. Uh, you can also store it all in a single compact SQLite file. I, I think that's the default for probably most plugins. Uh, it's fine, but it also then means acting on that data is not quite as easy as if you do a, a straight up SQL database, uh, which is what we used on our creative mode server with the Fab Lab. 
So all of these are things that you can do on the server, set up a database in the workshop. I, I well, actually the workshop, I didn't go through this, but what, what I had planned to do if we had had time uh, was to set up uh, MySQL with PHP, my admin, and show people how they could set up a local database on their computer. Uh, generally, the Minecraft server that you're setting up acts like a website server in a lot of ways. And this is helpful then too, because if you have your, your domain tied to your server, people could then go visit that and you could have a web page about your server too. It could be like, you know, here's my, you know, my classroom's uh, website server and here's the latest data on what people are building and doing together. We had 15, uh, you know, buildings made today in this area of blocks. You know, you could have some statistics that you draw on from the database that are then presented in Apache server, which is really kind of cool. Uh, oh, and then uh, server-based resource packs. Here's some pictures of what I was talking about earlier, actually, with those custom HD skins. But if you're running your own server, one of the things you might want to do is simulate a different environment. So, you know, we're doing exoplanets where we have to replace out the moon with a different color or a different size or shape or something. And so we're messing around with resource packs. Uh, but you could also do this with sounds. You could have a server where like you're shrunk down like honey, I shrunk the kids. I know that that reference dates me. Uh, you're shrunk down really small and you're like exploring inside of a, a body in Minecraft and you're like like seeing these giant blood cells and maybe the flow of one, uh, you know, the one one part of the, the blood from one to area to another. Uh, you could make a custom resource pack to make that appearance possible. And then you could actually have that automatically uploaded to client computers when they connect. So that's another thing you might want to do to create more of that immersive experience of like both the interactions through plugins and then also the appearance through things like resource packs. Right, and then I've been talking about plugins, but I haven't really explained that. So there are like hundreds, thousands of different plugins. The challenge is always to find one that has got a development team beneath it that's that's on it, that, that is keeping it up to date and that is, makes it work for what you need to do. So I, I really take a page from usability research in, in determining which plugins to use for our servers. So you wanna convey system status. It's really good for users to know what's going on. I think actually the biggest problem with Minecraft is there's no mini map, is you don't really know where you are. And I know a lot of players are like, oh, but it's neat, you get this feeling of being lost. Yeah, but for a beginning player, who you want to like be able to like work with collaborate with other people that's not helpful especially if you're doing like creative mode build servers i think having a mini map is incredibly helpful to helping them figure out how to navigate and find stuff and do stuff so and i'm not talking the stupid little map in your hand you can't be holding that and doing other things very well so in, in the little map in your hand doesn't zoom in and out and you can't teleport on it so there are plugins to make mini maps possible uh, there are other plugins to make navigation possible. So one that we really like is the ability to return to the spawn point. So you can type slash spawn. So if somebody's lost, they type slash spawn and boop, they can go back to the beginning and start over and find where they're going. Uh, some others that we've used are TPA, so consensual teleporting. So if one player wants to teleport to another, they can ask the other player, can I do this through the game? They like slash type slash TPA in the other person's name and the other person can say yes or no. So if they don't wanna be found or don't wanna work with somebody, they can also say no to that. And that helps prevent griefing and other issues you might have. And then, uh, let's see here, we have multiverse portals. So that, that one is helpful. Uh, in that you can create portals to go between different versions or worlds in Minecraft. So you might have like a city made by this classroom and like a forest made by this other class or this other workshop, or you can kind of separate things. And then welcome message, letting them know like as they join the server, here's what the server's about and where you are and what's going on, what should you do? All basic stuff that is generally very obvious to anybody in usability, but uh, unfortunately a lot of, <laughs> a lot of uh, coder programmer folks don't think about these things. And so I think it's important to point them out. We also like preventing errors and allowing reversal of actions to usability concepts. So this also translates into classroom control when little kids wreck each other's stuff. Uh, so world guard, the ability to protect one area from other people and add flags about like what you're allowed to do there. Can you build? Can you place a sign? Can you open doors? You can change all those kinds of things. Core protect, which logs everybody's actions and you can undo actions. You can actually undo something that somebody built or, or like, you know, uh, redo something that was destroyed, that kind of stuff. And then permissions X, where we can adjust what they're able to do at different levels. So we, we used to have problems where I would be trying to instruct and the little kids would always be throwing potions at me. They couldn't attack me because we had turned off the attack ability, but they'd throw a potion, which wouldn't hurt me or anything, but it would be distracting. So we'd use permissions X to prevent the ability for them to throw potions. And I, you know, you can of course tell the little kid in person not to do that, but I found that the more that you do, just the more resistance you're gonna generate. 
And I'm not against having solutions where you say, hey, think about what you, what, how the instructor feels when you do that. And are, you, are the other kids going to really learn as much when you do that? You can try to make those kinds of bridges. But if you're doing that all day, all the time, you're not going to get anywhere. And it only works with little kids who are willing to listen to you and who care to be, have empathy. And so a lot of the time I've found that, especially with the junior high range, it's just easier to have a, a system that blocks a behavior that's not very productive. And there may be opportunities to work with behavior on a one-to-one -one personal basis in other ways. I would just like to close out things like potion throwing or, or attacking. Okay, and then algorithmically assisted work. Uh, there are lots and lots of plugins to help you do things more effectively. So instead of putting down one block at a time, you could say this block to this other block in a line, we're gonna make all of them stone, type of code, ready, boom, they're all stone. And you start to think about these ways of, of really creating in Minecraft with a computational assistance that, that empowers you. The computer helps you solve problems much faster and you have to think about things that can be automated. Um, and there's already a lot of that with redstone and farms and other things in Minecraft, but there's tons of plugins that do this kind of thing too, uh, creating different experiences with that. Um, and then tons and tons of stuff that we use two plugins that are basically just platforms. So like if you want to have just like floating information in the air, you might use something like holographic signs to enable that to be possible. So there are lots of like toolkits that have been made out there that enable one plugin. So when you design or download a plugin, you might have to check its prerequisites. And there are sort of libraries that you can use to build on top of. Um, we've actually built our own custom plugins, which has been really cool. Uh, there are great guides on how to do this to set up with Eclipse and learn how to program in Java. And they don't always have to be that complicated. Like, you know, we have one that's that's called temperature and it's based on things like altitude, a variable we give it based on the world and then your proximity to heat sources. So we give it uh, block types. And if you're nearby those block types, it has a temperature that's adjusted. That's actually not that hard to program. Uh, like I know it maybe sounds like a lot, but and, and some of the easiest mods I've seen are like ones where like if you cut down a tree, Instead of having the, you know, if you cut down the bottom block of a tree, instead of having the tree float there defying gravity, it detects, oh, you've cut down the bottom block, bottom block, and then the whole tree gets destroyed. So there's all kinds of great starter plugins like that. It doesn't have to be stuff like these other ones that are super complicated that I was talking about. Um, they can very much be in service to your classroom of a plugin that helps participants create or produce or understand data. Uh, is a good way to then learn something about their process and help be make it metacognitive of if they're documenting their process, they're more likely to learn, uh, understand their own learning. Okay, um, and then yes, finally, if you're gonna set up your server, uh, provide documentation uh, that will make it easier for other people to help you if you're asking for help on the internet or if you're just asking for help from other teachers. We at the Fab Lab have tried to have a big documentation page. That documentation also is just really helpful in workshops. You know, I know, I guess there's a, a big faux pas against handing out worksheets, but really the more I've gotten experience as a teacher, the more I like bringing things in over from the formal education world into the formal. So you have a worksheet where like maybe the kids draw a picture of what they're going to do before they go do it. It helps them think about it in another way. Or maybe you, you write down some of the, their goals for the day. There's stuff like this that I consider to be part of documentation, but we just disconnect from the computer a little bit to like either read something or write something. And you don't do it a lot. You do it just enough to help them kind of get out of that moment of like whether or not they should be building or, or you know, those kinds of the game mode stuff and into the general, what's this for and how does it work and how do we get back to where we were and how far have we come? That kind of stuff, documentation and reflection. Okay, uh, let's see. I think that the last slide here was just me reminding that we were gonna play <laughs> and test and um, we, we have to make sure that the server works. So uh, the, we the, no what's that, that phrase in the military of no plan survives contact with the enemy. You know, so we, we make these servers, we think we've blocked all the things the kids can do that are wrong and then they find something to break it again. And I usually start with smaller groups of kids that are willing to help me out and I test the server with them and then we throw it against all the ones that are, you know, not gonna help you out. <laughs> so that's my other suggestion with the server is, you know, if you're, if you're a teacher or a librarian, start playing on your own or with a few of the other librarians or like teen leaders or whatever it is and get some of your, your problems worked out before you unleash it to the rest of everybody else. And I also think having playtime in there also makes it a little bit more fun and worthwhile. You discover things by tinkering and playing along the way. New opportunities. 
So that's the conclusion here. This presentation is of course meant to parallel the tutorials we have on the WIMC grant website. So a lot of these things like how you install all this stuff, I didn't explain here. That's part of the website that walks you through a lot of those components. Uh, you may have to do some Googling to figure it out on your own. Uh, that is just how a lot of this stuff works. It's good practice to do that. So thank you for listening and best of luck in setting up your server.